Keeping the Tribe During Leadership Transition. Hey, it's Nikki Llewellyn, and you're on Gut Plus Science. This podcast is on a mission to increase engagement at work. And on this show, we equip CEOs and people-first leaders of all levels to make impact. Let's get to it. One of the most awesome things about being a podcast host are the people you get to meet. I get to have a front row seat to mentoring from Gary Ridge today. Uh, That's awesome. And today we are honing in on his 25 years leading at WD-40 and what a thoughtful, strategic, and meaning-filled transition looks like as he is in the process of finalizing the passing of the CEO baton for right now. Let's grab Gary. Gary Ridge, welcome to Gut Plus Science. I am thrilled to have this conversation with you today. I'm just going to be a sponge. I am the mentee, and we are a vehicle to share so many of the great experiences and along the path of your leadership journey today with our listeners. Just so excited that you're here. Thank you for taking the time to do this. So Gary, due to your extensive leadership history, I would love for you to start off by summarizing your journey at WD-40 before we dive into the transition that you're in right now. And I just want to highlight today some of the most remarkable leadership steps and experiences that you've taken. But before we do that, I'd love for you just to give us a little bit of background. Yeah. G'day, Nikki. It's great to be with you. And can I give you my official introduction? I'd love that. Okay. G'day. I'm Gary Ridge. I'm the consciously incompetent, probably wrong, and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD-40 Company. A little bit of background. I started with the company with a fax machine under my bed. Back in 1987, in my hometown of Sydney, Australia, I was opening the Australian subsidiary. We worked on that for six months. We opened uh, for business on January 1, 1988. And for the next years, up until 1994, I spent most of my time actually up in Asia as we started to plant the blue and yellow can with little red top seeds in the Asian countries. In 1994, I was having a conversation with my then boss, who was the president of the company, And I said to Jerry, is there anything else you'd like me to do? And he said, well, funny, you should ask, would you like to move to the United States? And I said, why? And he said, well, we really believe that there's an opportunity to grow our brand globally. You like to do that. Why don't you come over and do it? I thought, wow. You know, a friend of mine, Whitney Johnson, wrote a book about the S-curve and the greatest opportunities you have as a leader in life is when you disrupt yourself. And that was truly disruption, moving 8,000 plus miles across the world. But so I arrived in San Diego on July 17th, 1994. And I worked mainly in our international side of our business. And then in 1997, the CEO retired. And for some reason, the board thought I might be a good person to have the privilege to lead the company. And so on October 7th, 1997, I was given the privilege to lead as CEO and and have been on that journey right up until now and will be until the end of August. Wow. WD-40 is known, you know, many people know the product and, you know, anytime you think WD-40, you know, the look actually, as I'm recording with you here, I can see your background and I can see that WD-40 logo in the back, but it's also very known for the culture. So many articles that have been written and speaking engagements that you've done. So I know it is loud out in the community. The WD-40 culture is unique. It really stands out. And I'd love to dive into what I've seen and what some of the other listeners had opted in to say, can you dig on this? The tribe. So the WD-40 tribe, tell us about how this name came to be and what is at the core of WD-40's tribe? Well, the core of it is belonging. One of the the biggest desires and needs we have as human beings is to belong. Anybody who is on this call today has probably left a party, an event, and or a company, or even a relationship because they didn't feel like they belong. But if I go back to the start of this journey, I'll admit that the day that I was given the opportunity to lead the company, I was scared. I didn't know how... I was going to create a culture or what a culture really looked like. And I was reading some of the work of the Dalai Lama. I was 35,000 feet over the Pacific Ocean in this aluminium tube, probably the only light on in. And I read this statement, our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. And at the same time, I read something from Aristotle that said, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. 
And what hit me was there were so many leaders I was observing out there that, number one, were not putting pleasure in the job. And number two, they weren't sending people home happy. So I went back to school. I went to the University of San Diego. I did a master's degree in leadership. That's where I met my mentor and dear friend, Dr. Ken Blanchard, the One Minute Manager. He was my professor. And in that course around studying the power of servant leadership, what became clear to me was the tribal culture was really important. How do you have a group of people that come together every day to protect and feed each other? And tribes are the the whole creation of, of human being. We're all, we all started in tribes somewhere, somehow. Absolutely. You know, before we go into the honing of our conversation, which is around your transition and how you've teed up the opportunity or the pathway to keep the culture, keep the tribe through all of this and what you've learned through that, I want to dig on what you shared as you were asked to take on the CEO role and to move miles and miles away. And also just you sharing like, I was fearful. That was scary to take that step. For those listening right now that heard you say that, and then they're like, wow, I'm at a place that I'm just treading uneasy water or stepping into something or taking the big leap. What were those core things that you did during that time that you would mentor someone else going through a big leap, taking a big step, those core things in your bucket really that helped you during that time? Don't do it alone. (laughs) Get comfortable with the three most powerful words you'll ever have in your leadership notebook. Those three words are, I don't know. And get comfortable not knowing because if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need to have and develop people around you that have specialized skills in certain areas. And that's one of the attributes of a tribe. The other thing is you need to be a forever learner and a forever teacher. You know, if you think about the role and the responsibility of a leader or what we call a coach at WD40 Company, we don't have any managers. Everyone's called a coach. Our job is to be learners and teachers. And if you reflect on the Indigenous Australians, many years ago, if you were to observe a tribal meeting, what you would see would be the elder tribe member teaching the younger tribe members how to throw boomerangs. Why were they teaching them to throw boomerangs? Because without a boomerang, you wouldn't survive. So the most important things, you're not doing it alone. It's okay not to know. Be a learner and teacher and teach a lot of people to throw boomerangs. And maybe to dive just a little deeper into the tribe at WD40, could you give us a few examples of some of, over the years, your favorite initiatives that have come up from tribe members' ideas or a story that happened where others really supported each other? What comes to mind just to kind of illustrate what the WD40 tribe really feels like and looks like? Well, let's go back to our tribal promise, a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other. And our just cause is to make life better at home and at work. And if you think about our theory on failure, the thing about our tribal behavior is we don't make mistakes. We have what we call learning moments. And a learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. So one of the, this togetherness of a tribe creates psychological safety, reduces fear, and makes vulnerability a comfort zone instead of a discomfort zone. So as we transition our conversation around your transition, the big leadership transition that's happening right now in your world, can you talk a little bit about the length of time in preparation up until today? Take us back to when the transition conversation started and just illustrate the length of time that you've been working towards this. Eight years ago was when we started the, the journey. I identified that you know, probably within the next eight or so years, I would want to let the, a new tribal leader lead us into the future. So about eight years ago, we identified some possible people within the company. Number one, I was determined that this was going to be an internal succession because it had to be someone who valued the tribe and valued that culture is a competitive advantage. So we identified a few people and then five years ago, the person that we wanted to take to the next step was selected. And that's Steve Brass, who's gonna be our new president and CEO 
And Steve was actually based in the UK and he's been with the company for 31 years. So he understands the value of the tribe. But he'd worked most of his period of time in the UK and Europe. So the number one thing was, let's see if Steve can assimilate to another culture. So five years ago, we gave him the opportunity to disrupt himself a bit like I did. And we moved Steve and his family from the UK to San Diego. Now, interestingly enough, Steve and I have something very similar in common. He actually opened our German subsidiary with a fax machine under his bed about 26 years ago. So we both have done that. So Steve moved over here. He was the president of our America's division for three years. I wanted to make sure he, he felt comfortable. But more importantly, that his family felt okay here. I know what it's like to transfer a family from one culture to another. And that all worked out. And then two years ago, just before COVID roller coaster came to us, we made Steve our president and COO. So now we're working hand in glove, like two birds in a lamb's tail. And then just uh, in March, we announced that Steve would now succeed me at the end of August this year when I complete my 25-year leadership apprenticeship. And I'd love for you to share with us the key learnings or, I don't know, best practices that you've come to find in preparing for communicating this transition to your people or, or your tribe. Well, I, I think number one is as a public company, you know, you can't go out and say this person has been selected because that decision hadn't been made. But I think along the way, if you're getting signals from the tribe or the people as you someone is actually being, if you like, maneuvered into a role that are positive, then again, those are the sort of signals you want to get. And certainly we were getting those signals with Steve. The other thing is the leader will only succeed if the leadership team accepts the leader. So that was important. So we'd already established the fact that was going to happen because he's not an unknown character. It's not like, who is this person? Steve was very involved with our Global Strategic Council. He's worked in a number of countries, you know, and not only that, he had the support of our European team already because he was kind of there, he was their leader for a number of years. So if I brought someone in that didn't have the support of both or all three geographic regions, if you will, that would have been more difficult. Gary, most transitions don't start eight years out. I think that is a very rare standout thing, right? And so then there's not this time built in for unexpected experiences or hurdles that may come up. And so you did plan a very long road to be able to do this as best as you could. Share with us what unexpected experiences have happened in the past eight years during this transition planning. COVID. <laughs> I never dreamt that I would spend the probable last two years as the leader leading through a pandemic that absolutely disrupted the world. But it was a great experience and one that I certainly would not wish the hurt of COVID on anybody. And that's not right. However, what we had to learn, Steve and I and the tribe had to learn together during that period, was absolutely remarkable. And when the, the, the COVID switch got switched on in March 2020, and we had to pivot immediately, and day by day, how were we going to lead our business? The definition of uncertainty is a series of future events that may or may not occur. And my gosh, we had an abundance of uncertainty. But it was such a wonderful learning experience to enable us to really look at some of the key strengths of our business around our culture. And I would have hated to go into COVID and have a very poor culture. And I think that's played out in business a lot. There was some research done. Hubert Jolet, who wrote a book, The Heart of Business, he turned around Best Buy. He did some research for his book at, during COVID. They surveyed 1,900 people in countries around the world, and employee engagement had dropped to 16%, which is terrible. 
And in fact, I just wrote an article that I published on LinkedIn that talks about what I say, the great escape. Are people escaping your company or are they escaping to your company? And those that are escaping from companies are because of culture. So the great learning was we tested our culture. We really tested our culture and it came through with shining colors. So if anything was disruptive, that was the most disruptive. Yeah. And I'm curious to know what, because of COVID, like what are some of those silver linings, like some of those changes that if COVID wasn't there today, the way you're operating wouldn't be because it did create that. Give us a couple of those. One thing that I became clear of in the, in times of real and great need, people can pivot around fear. And there was a lot of things that we never did because we were afraid. For example, really maximizing the use of virtual communication. We had all of this wonderful stuff installed in our businesses all around the world, but people were afraid to use it because they didn't want to seem to be vulnerable. The other thing was they were afraid to use it because they thought it would absolutely take away the connection. What we've learned is you can do both. This is a hybrid world now. And a lot of people now are talking about how do you bring people back to work? Well, how do you make work exciting so that when people run out the door in the morning, they give their partner, friend or whoever a high five and say, I'm really looking forward to going to the office today because I'm going to do exciting stuff. So what it's made us do is think about what work do we have to do in person and how do we make that exciting and what work can we do hybridly or from anywhere in the world? We came up with a philosophy, not work from home, but work from where. We don't care where people work. What we realized was we were working from where all the time. I don't know how many hours I've worked for at 35,000 feet in an aluminium tube. So that was really a, an awareness that was really clear to us. During this time, these many years that you've been planning for the transition, mentor others that are planning to go through this and just give your best advice for leaders that are preparing to pass the baton. One I will throw you is what we're learning from you is think about the time frame. Most are like planning in a year, right? Two years, something much shorter term. So you maybe speak into the length of time, but what are the other things that you would give as your best advice in helping a CEO with a successful transition? Well, number one is, do you know the key important aspects of the person that you need to lead into the future? Number two is, you will never replace you. That's not what you're doing. You're providing a platform for a new leader. A lot of people have said to me, Steve's not Gary. And I said, lucky Steve, because it's not about replacing me. It's about creating a platform over a period of time that a new leader can come and move through the organization and lead it into the future. The other thing that's really important is if you think about what the foundation of, the, of any business is, it's their values. So do you have an, as an organization have a clearly defined set of executable values that are acting as the foundation so that whoever comes as the leader, if they should in any way, stumble, the foundation will keep them strong. So it's one of the, if not the, it's probably one of the most important parts of our company is having a set of values in place that are there to be the underneath foundation of our culture. So I'm curious, Gary, if you had to pick the most rewarding part of your CEO journey of all the years, what rises to the top? The people. It's all about the people. When I'm 102 on my deathbed or whenever that time comes, it'll be the moments in my career where I've had the opportunity to just hold someone's elbow and help them on to the next step that are really the most meaningful for me. Our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. And just the experiences of being a reasonable coach along the way and watching some of the folks that we've had the opportunity just to touch in a little way become greater than they ever thought they could. That's where it really matters. The rest goes back in the box. I want to dig in just a little bit, knowing that Gut Plus Science lives on the People Forward Network. So all of our shows 
tap into leaders that are on the people first journey. So that's the common theme is everyone shares this heart or this passion or this interest area of people first. And I'm curious to know from you, when you think leading with a people first heart and mindset, how do you define that? And just elaborate a little bit on your perspective of what that means. It means your empathy eats your ego instead of your ego eating your empathy, number one. And don't be Al, the soul-sucking leader. And the soul-sucking leader has attributes that don't lean into people first. For example, the soul-sucking leader thinks they're corporate royalty. They must always be right. They love to micromanage. They hate feedback. They don't think learning is necessary. Where the, the servant leader is about, it's all about the people. You have to love your people. You have to have a harder goal than the backbone of steel. You have to be a coach. It, learning is something that you talk about every day. But most importantly, as I said, it's making sure that your empathy eats your ego and your ego doesn't eat your empathy. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And I want you to tell our listeners just a little bit about Al. I know they can go look up Al on online, but just tell a little bit about that, where Al came from and like how you leverage his character in a lot of what you've done. So Al is the soul sucking CEO of Fear Inc. I created Al. He's a little doll that I created. And I got the idea from my friend Chester Elton, who who wrote the book, The Carrot Principle. I was with him one time and he was throwing out carrots into the audience or little carrot dolls. And I thought, I need to have something to be able to give people after I've talked about Al. So if they know an Al, this doll might just find it onto Al's desk. And it actually has the website on the back. So Al is someone I created that I could talk about, who is this leader with all of these bad habits that create toxic cultures. I have an algorithm for culture. Culture equals parentheses, values plus behavior, close parentheses times consistency. And the equal sign means happens when. So to build a great culture, you have to have a clear set of values in the organization, but it's the behavior of the leaders that is really the toxin that goes into what I call the Petri dish of culture. When I was going to school in Australia years ago, my science teacher gave me a Petri dish and they said, okay, we're going to grow culture in this Petri dish, and but we want to grow good culture. What's important? Number one, what you put into it. And number two, how do you take care of it? And what we're going to do by taking care of it in our behavior is we're going to watch that Petri dish every day. And as leaders, we're going to love that Petri dish enough to be able to nurture it but we're also going to be brave enough to take out any toxins that are getting in that Petri dish or treat those toxins so they don't send the culture sour. So I think that's really, really important that we think about the importance of culture. And Al allows me to talk about all these things and not really reference someone that anybody really cares about other than yeah. this crazy looking doll. Yeah. All of the examples, don't be Al. Don't be Al. Don't be out. <laughs> hey, Gary, I want to come back really quick to the equation. Can you share that one more time? Because I was going to write it down. I couldn't get it all. And I'm sure our listeners want to hear that one more time. Culture equals, and the equal sign means happens when, parentheses, values plus behavior, close parentheses, times consistency. So good culture happens when you have values and behavior together and you have consistency around what those ingredients of values are and what are the behaviors that you need to have as a leader to grow great culture. I love the equation. I love the Petri dish example. So Gary, what's next? You know, after your 25th anniversary, that's when the transition's officially happening. And talk about like what's next for you, how you'll continue to play a role in WD40's future. Well, I was saying to someone the other day, I'm a very lucky man. I've just done a 25-year apprenticeship around building cultures in an organization. So going forward, I'm going to be the culture coach. I want to talk to leaders who believe culture can be a competitive advantage, and I want to help them build a culture of strength. That's what's important to me. As far as WD-40 is concerned, they've given me a lovely uh, honorary title called Chairman Emeritus which means I have no responsibility, no authority, 
that I can go to any party I like, which I really think is really nice. But WD-40, the tribe will always be in my heart. I want them to be so successful. They say that the real reflection of a someone who was okay at being a leader is to watch what they left thrive. And I want it to thrive into the, and it will thrive into the future. So I'm excited about that. I, I'm on the board of a couple of other companies that I really love being involved in, probably write a new book called The Learning Moment, do some more public speaking and build a house in Hawaii. That's so great. And I would love to make sure that our listeners know where to stay up with your content online. Where is the best place for them to stay in touch, see your latest writings? I know you mentioned a couple of things that you've recently released. I publish articles on LinkedIn. So you can find me, search Gary Ridge on LinkedIn. And then I have a website, uh, www.thelearningmoment.net, thelearningmoment.net. I put you know, blogs on there and my favorite reading and uh, that sort of stuff. So, but LinkedIn and the, and the website are the two best places. Awesome. And we'll link that into the show notes. So for those of you that want to be able to just click and go straight there, or save that on your mobile device or wherever, we'll have that in the show notes. You can go ahead and look for that. Awesome. Well, Gary, thank you so much for your time. We're going to transition into what we call our lightning round. We'll take just a quick break where we'll hear a sponsor message and then come back. And we want to learn a little bit more about the personal side of you and some of your favorite things. If you're leading with a people first mindset, which most likely you are because you're listening to Gut Plus Science, join People Forward Network, the largest community of humans on a shared mission to lead meaningful work. You can find us at peopleforwardnetwork.com or follow People Forward Network on LinkedIn. All right, we're back on Gut Plus Science with Gary Ridge. It's been a wonderful, remarkable conversation today. I've loved every minute of it and I hope there's as many key takeaways for you. Sitting here, summary, I'm on my second sheet of paper with all these key takeaways. So we'll have to figure out how I summarize all of this. But uh, Gary, this is the part where we do our lightning round that allows uh, our listeners and myself just to get to know some of your favorite things. So I bet this is going to be hard for you. I'm so curious about your answer. Favorite book of all time or favorite recent read? Favorite book of all time is Everything You Need to Know You Learned in Kindergarten by Robert Fulgram. Favorite recent read is The Earned Life by Marshall Goldsmith. How about your favorite hobby when you're not working? Teaching. And how about, Gary, your favorite vacation spot? There's two. Uh, Liku Liku Lagoon in Fiji or our new to be nearly permanent home, and Amy Beach in Hawaii. What a treat to spend time with Gary Ridge today. And our conversation was rooted in keeping the tribe during leadership transition, really shining a light on the eight years that they've taken to work on this transition coming up on Gary's 25 year anniversary and passing the baton and just how strategic the focus was around making sure that this was the right fit and really helping the new CEO come in and to set the stage for the tribe to continue and to thrive as the change happens. And just beautiful, the key takeaway there is the time and strategic, thoughtful, people-first focus in the transition. But I want to focus my truth you can act on, you know, really, I bet these are Gary's key tips, like if in his book or in his efforts, these are just things that people that know Gary probably are like, yep, that's what Gary says, like key takeaway stuff just from the mentorship with Gary today. So I'm doing the the truth you can act on just a little bit different really around his mentorship and just best practices that I took away. So here we go. Number one, don't do it alone. Nothing ever. Create a tribe around you and be that tribe for others. Don't do it alone. Number two, say, I don't know when you don't know. Number three, disrupt yourself and watch growth happen in that disruption. It's that stepping outside the comfort zone, not the norm, out of the box, and dang, watch yourself grow. Number four, tap into your superpowers and help your people do the same. That is where the best of the best lives. Number five, empathy eats your ego, not the opposite. And number six, culture equals values plus behavior times consistency. So good. I love that definition. Oh, I absolutely love this conversation today. A huge shout out to our greatest ambassador, Tanya Dittman, for helping us to connect with Gary, another amazing guest on Gut Plus Science. We hope you're all inspired. We'll see you next time.
We just left the world a little bit better. Now go do something with it.